All right. Um, good morning, um, everyone, or good evening for those who are in Israel. Uh, so I'm filling in for Tomoyuki Morimae. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the plenary, this plenary talk um, by Omri Shmueli, who's a student at Tel Aviv University. So Omri is the recipient of the Best Student Paper Award. Um, and he's going to tell us about public key quantum money with a classical um, bank. Before you start, Omri, uh, for people who are watching us online, I remind you that you can use the, the chat feature or the Q&A feature during the talk. Um, and then after the talk ends, you can join a separate Zoom, uh, which will be a Q&A with, uh, with Omri, which will be a regular Zoom meeting. Okay, so um, Omri, it's uh, all yours. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas, for the introduction. So uh, welcome to this talk on a public quantum money with classical bank. So let's let's open this talk with the with the subject of this talk, which is quantum money, or more precisely, a public key quantum money. So what is um, um, quantum money? Quantum money without the public key was introduced uh, uh, first by Wiesner at uh, 1969, and then the public key version by Alonso and Cristiano in 2012. It uh, consists of uh, a bank and users. And the first algorithm of the scheme is a quantum algorithm called the bank. It samples a classical public key along with a quantum bank note. And uh, you can think without the loss of generality that uh, this uh, public key contains the signature of the bank. Uh, this public key can then be distributed in the system. And the, the single copy of this quantum bank note can then be uh, sent to one, uh, one of the chosen users in the system. Uh, and then, when, uh, when it's already in the system, this backdrop can be passed around uh, from user to user, and then comes our second algorithm, which is the verification. Uh, the verification is a quantum algorithm, it gets the classical public key and the alleged quantum banknote, and it outputs a classical bit, accepts or rejects the banknote, and also, also tries to keep the copy of the banknote. We would aspire that if this banknote is legit, then it, this uh, output copy stays stays forward, stays legit. Um, more formally, in terms of the correctness, uh, if the bank executes honestly and sends this banknote to any to any part of the system, then this uh, banknote that was generated by the algorithm by the book is going to get uh, uh, verified. With high probability, with probability exponentially close to one. Um, security, which we call no cloning, says that again, if the bank executes honestly and then sends one a single copy to one possibly malicious user, then any quantum polynomial time user in the system tries to get one copy and output two copies, such that both of these copies pass the public verification. This happens only with the negligible probability. So you cannot clone, you cannot, the money keeps its value. Um, so this is the definition. Um, and quantum money really needs no introduction, but just a few words. Um, so the, the first version was introduced by Wisner, as we said earlier. Uh, the idea was an ideal form of digital cash. And the public key version, which the definition of we just saw, uh, was introduced by Alonzo Cristiano, and it really the, the public key version really um, makes uh, the definition uh, behave like a true digital cash. Transactions are both local; use the, only the two parties that are involved in the transaction know about it, know, know about it, and it's secure because of the no clone. And we can compare like uh, quantum money and specifically public key quantum money to, to other uh, solutions that we already have, like physical banknotes. It's much more uh, it's more secure than physical banknotes here because physical banknotes are like theoretically clonable and much more efficient, much faster. Physical banknotes are very hard uh, to move around. Uh, it's private, unlike bank transactions, because the bank knows about this, this transaction that we're doing, and it's efficient, uh, unlike cryptocurrencies, which we know are very, like, one of the most inefficient ways 
uh, to communicate currency. Um, so now we want to we want to know what how to what we know about in terms of constructing public key quantum money. So uh, this is mainly contained in two works. The first is the work that actually introduced it by Amazon and Cristiano, and they show uh, how to construct public key quantum money relative to a classical oracle, the quantum equilibrium of classical oracle. And later, uh, Zandri in 2018 shows that actually we can, we can actually uh, construct public key quantum money based on uh, computational assumptions. And uh, assuming quantum secure indistinguishability obfuscation, and also injecting one way functions, uh, we can construct public equality. So we, we have like valid uh, constructions of uh, public equality. Money. Now we want to actually execute. So we need quantum computation to generate banknotes and verify banknotes. And we need quantum communication to move uh, banknotes around. And it is clear that quantum computation is absolutely minimal here. And it's unclear that the quantum communication part is also like absolutely necessary. And uh, with accordance, it is uh, a central open question in the field of quantum money that we want to preserve all of the previous, all of the previous uh, abilities of public key quantum money and uh, use quantum computation, but only classical communication. And uh, maybe the motivation is clear, maybe not entirely, but uh, just to, to get our head, heads around it and why, why, why we would like it. So theoretically, it would give the minimal model because we know quantum computation is necessary. Uh, but I think more importantly, the, like uh, the punch here is the actual like, things we can do with classical communication. So uh, here are a few examples. One is information broadcasting, where we have a single message. We want to, to send it to a lot of different directions, and we clone it many times, and then send it to all of these directions. This requires the cloning information. This also the, the technique that enables uh, the technology of uh, mobile communication, and specifically broadcasting. Um, we have much more efficient error broadcasting codes. The classical error broadcasting because they have better rate and also um, they're just faster. They have better algorithms compared to quantum error correcting codes. And even like putting error correcting codes aside for a moment, um, classical information is much more durable. It's, it's, it's much more stable uh, than quantum information, even if it's not protected. And like as a classical, as a practical bonus, uh, we already have a rich infrastructure of classical communication. So um, it's clear to us that we want classical communication. And the solution to this, the a, a definition that captures this, is public key semi quantum. So, what is this thing? Uh, it was defined and introduced by Radian and Saturn in 2020. And it's very simple it's public key quantum money, where the bank is classical. Uh, more formally, it has two additional properties uh, added to, to the previous definition, classical minting and classical certificates of destruction. So let's see what is classical. If before uh, the bank wanted to send one a banknote to one of the users, it generates the banknote by, by itself on its uh, computer and sends the banknote to the user using quantum communication. Now the bank is classical. It interacts with the user. We have two algorithms, a classical bank and a quantum receiver. The user can execute this quantum receiver algorithm. And at the end of this classical interaction, only this style is quantum, uh, the receiver obtains a banknote and the bank uh, obtains the classical public key. Um, and, and actually, we transfer the bank, if it's not clear, we transfer the banknote to the, um, the user without using quantum communication. Um, the classical certificates of extraction mechanism, or CCD, um, lets a user to return a banknote back to the bank, to deposit the banknote. So before we had this quantum banknote, it just returns the banknote to the bank, 
and the bank verifies it, and now um, the banknote um, can be destroyed using this new mechanism, certificate generation. It derives this classical certificate of destruction and sends it to the bank. And the bank verifies this certificate and reimbi like, uh, reimburses the, the, the balance of the, the, the user if this is verified. So um, why is this called a certificate of destruction? This comes up in the uh, security. So security, also called the no counterfeiting, says that if the bank executes honestly and it interacts with a possibly malicious quantum user, a quantum polynomial user, and the user tries to output both, one, a banknote, and two, a quantum banknote, and two, a classical certificate of destruction for this banknote, the probability that both of them pass the quantum and classical verification uh, corresponding uh, is uh, negligible. So this means that if you see this, it really means that the quantum backlog is effectively destroyed. It cannot pass uh, any longer the quantum verification. And this is why earlier the bank uh, reimbursed the balance of the user who showed the certificate. Um, Okay, so we saw two directions of uh, classical uh, communication um, from bank to user by classical meeting, from user to the back to the bank by the CCD mechanism, and uh, from one user to another before we have only the quantum option. And now if Alice, one side, wants to send Bob uh, a, say a hundred dollar worth of this quantum banknote using only classical uh, uh, communication, Alice can destroy the banknote, send the certificate to the bank, the bank verifies it, and then uh, effectively sends the hundred dollars to Bob by generating a new quantum banknote on the computer of uh, Bob, of the receiver of this, of this product. Um, so a few words on this. Um, this one last option is not entirely private. And uh, we can make the identities of the parties, the sender and the receiver of this transaction relatively, uh, uh, we can actually make them anonymous by uh, relatively simple tricks. The one thing that uh, the, the main caveat here is that uh, the bank always still knows the original serial number, this public key. It knows that the bank note, this specific bank note moved from here to there, um, which is information. And this is why uh, we still have the previous uh, direct quantum uh, option. Um, okay, so this is the definition of uh, the fully quantum uh, scheme, and this is the definition of the semi-quantum scheme. And one last word is that, uh, like a bonus with the semi-quantum money, is that we can decentralize the bank. We can decentralize the bank because we can use a, it's a completely classical algorithm. That after the banknote generation, this algorithm is public. It doesn't use any like trapdoor information or secret information. So uh, only the, the meeting process can be made uh, by classic, opens the, the, the possibility of classical MPC, like uh, decentralizing the, the bank is um, Okay, so now we want to construct public is um, in the same work that it was uh, introduced, um, Radian and Sata show that uh, quantum lightning, uh, a very advanced uh, quantum cryptographic uh, primitive, along with some much more simpler uh, digital uh, signatures, uh, implies a public summer quantum. Um, unfortunately, uh, quantum lightning is not known like under any well-founded cryptographic assumption and the only construction uh, turned out to be more uh, vulnerable than we thought by later it was discovered by uh, robots. Which um, leads us to the result of this work. Uh, we will see that we can construct public instrument quantum money um, if we assume the sub-exponential hardness of LWE. And uh, quant like before, quantum secure and distinguishability obfuscation for classical circuits. So just a few uh, words on, the, on these uh, assumptions. 
So learning with elbows is a, like one of the most standard assumptions. And we won't go into deeper than that. It's well, well, very well understood. And uh, this computational problem is also believed to be resilient against the uh, quantum sub-exponential time algorithms. And uh, indistinguishability obfuscation, or in short, IO, this is an algorithm, an efficient classical algorithm. Uh, it gets as input a classical circuit, it outputs an obfuscated circuit. And uh, the intention of this very powerful cryptographic tool is to hide the inner workings of this, like uh, the algorithm of the obfuscated itself. And uh, this is rarely happens. This is rarely the case, but sometimes it very it happens. Sometimes it happens, and always it helps to think about the obfuscated circuit as ideal obfuscation, which means that. Uh, this obfuscated circuit doesn't really give us uh, anything more than the uh, Oracle Lexus to the original circuit. So it behaves like a black box. And we know how to construct a classical secure IO, which means IO for classical circuits secure against the uh, um, classical distinguishers. And the quantum secure version, which is IO for classical circuits, which is secure against quantum adversaries, which is the one we use. Uh, seen major recent progress uh, over the uh, year or so. So on to um, the technical parts of our uh, construction. Um, so this is what we want to construct. We want to construct this definition. And uh, for the sake of this talk, um, what we claim is that uh, these three tasks, the delegation of the generation of the state, and the public verification, along with the fact that it is unclonable. These two, three together in our specific construction, uh, it's going to capture the assets. The rest uh, of the functionalities and security of uh, the scheme are going to come for free. So this is why we're going to focus on this. So this is a classical algorithm that generates a publicly verifiable and unclonable state, which is exactly captured by this like uh, focus. So what we want, the main technical question that we try to answer is we want a classical computer, which is going to be played by the bank, uh, to delegate the quantum computer, which is going to be the receiver, uh, of one of the users, a state that has two, uh, two properties, unclonable and public verified. And uh, just a few words on the previous work. Uh, there is this very famous uh, a work uh, from uh, Fox uh, 2018 by Volkerski, uh, Christian Mahadev, Azirani, and Vidic, showing this primitive noisy vector flow free functions based on LWD on learning with errors. And uh, later, when uh, semi quantum money was introduced, Radian and Sabbath observed that these NPCFs um, can enable this generation, this delegation of generating the state. But, and the state is a clonable, but it's only privately verified. And this is the gap that we're trying to solve. We want to make this, the state publicly verified. And uh, this means we're like making like ourselves focus on a, a task uh, cleaner and cleaner. We want a protocol between classical center who wants to uh, delegate the generation of the state. We want a quantum receiver, uh, which is the one that actually generates the state on its own computer. And at the end of this interaction, um, a sender holds the public, the classical public key, the receiver holds this uh, quantum vector. And we furthermore propose a general template. It's going to help us uh, to, to see the previous work and understand why we don't know how to use it in order to make it publicly verifiable, and it's also going to be useful for our actual construction. So um, these are just, just notations for now. Um, there is a classically efficient decentralized distribution, Chi. We sample a generation key and a secret key. We have a generator that gets this classical generation key and outputs two quantum registers. Each of these registers is n qubits. It is a pure quantum circuit. These are just notations. And at the end of this computation of G, we measure only register B to get this measurement result, beta, n bit string. We call it the serial number. 
and because the register n we are possibly entangled, um, a collapses to this marginal quantum state, which we call the sampled state denoted by psi vector. Um, nothing special said yet. So here comes the interesting part. We need these properties. One, verification. There is an efficient um, computation that gets this secret key. And for every um, serial number, it computes some secret function, some secret classical circuit F beta. Um, two, this separate state, it can be verified given only quantum or verified quantum, but given only quantum or access to this classical function uh, F beta. So this is in terms of verification, in terms of security or probability, we would like that for every beta, this state, the separate state, is going to be unclonable, but even given this information, knowing G, knowing the generation T, and also knowing the oracle, having oracle access to F beta. So it's, it's, uh, the point here is that the computer that executes this and have access to this, the oracle access uh, of uh, F beta, uh, it's the one actually generating this state psi beta. And you want the computer that actually generate the state itself to be unable to output the focus of the state that it itself generated. Um, and how do we use this uh, term, this template, and these uh, properties? Um, sender can sample a generation of secret key. It can send this public generation key to the receiver. The receiver performs this computation, it measures, it gets the central state, and it sends the measurement result back to the sender. The sender computes the description of F beta and then gives an obfuscation, sends an obfuscated circuit of the circuit F beta. And just momentarily, we're going to think about this as ideal obfuscation for before, which means that effectively, by sending this ideally obfuscated circuit F beta, the sender enables a, a quantum oracle access to this classical function F beta. Uh, enablers and only enablers. So um, the output of the sender would be the public key, which is the obfuscated circuit. The receiver uh, outputs this banknote, which is just the central state. And uh, the state is unclonable by just by the definition of the template. And uh, verification. Um, so we said that this, this state is is uh, verifiable given the Oracle access to F, which we get. So it's also verifiable. Um, okay, so now considering the previous work, uh, the scheme that is based on NTCFs uh, through this uh, template, um, it captures the, like uh, this, 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 this skeleton of the protocol, it, it captures uh, the previous protocol as well. Uh, the generated state from the previous work is also unclonable, uh, and it's also verifiable given the, the, the only the classical only the quantum oracle access to this uh, function, the classical function. The point is that it cannot happen together. So, um, given this uh, oracle access, it becomes verifiable, but it also becomes clonable. So the verification must stay quiet. You cannot just enable it to anyone. So this cannot happen. This uh, uh, final message, if it's sent, if it is not sent, we don't have, th this guy cannot, cannot verify the, the banknote. And if we, uh, we do send it, then we don't have to. Um, okay, so now we, we start with our techniques. Um, so we want to implement this, uh, implement this template, the same notations in the same general structure. And chi sample is a uh, generation secret key. And these notations, they, they don't really uh, tell us a lot of, uh, it is kind of structure, but it, it's not enough to tell us how, what we want, what properties we want from these uh, algorithms in order to achieve our goal. 
So here is a guiding question. What is the minimal yet expressive property we want from this algorithm? In minimal, I mean like a formally logically necessary, a necessary condition, but expressive, this condition we aspire for it to be a, a highly non trivial. So it really captures something. It's not just a, 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 a trivial necessary condition. So here is one possible answer. We want the measurement result of this computation. After this was sampled honestly, these pair of keys, this measurement, this classical measurement result, we want it to be uh, uh, entropic to mass contain entropy. Let's explain what this means. So if this is sampled honestly, and this is a quantum computation. It's not how we have endless, like endless examples of quantum algorithms that uh, generate uh, uh, by, by measurement, by quantum computation, and then measurement entry. But here, uh, the computer generating, the, the computer executing this is possibly malicious. And even if this possibly malicious quantum uh, uh, executed computer wants to, the this string won't be entropic, wants to aim for some specific uh, beta, um, it cannot be the case. It's like has uncontrollable entropy or, ent or forced entropy. And why do we care about this, this like uh, somewhat uh, maybe weird condition of forced entropy? Uh, we just want this to happen on the computer of a possibly malicious uh, uh, quantum algorithm. And we want this to be unclonable. But now we're talking about this having forced entropy. So the connection is that um, assume for a moment that beta wouldn't have forced entropy. So um, you can aim for some beta. There is some beta that comes up along with this quantum power. They come together with some like good probability, say one over a hundred. And this means that with probability one over a hundred squared, you can do this twice, which is still a good probability, one over uh, 10,000. You get two copies, so you clone with a good probability. In other more formal words, this, the fact that beta, this measurement result has forced entropy is necessary condition for, the, for our goal of a clonable state. So this is now what we're looking for. And when we look at this, this condition, one, one example comes to mind. Comes to so uh, we, we um, arrived to our main tool, which is hybrid quantum fully of encryption, constructed by a series of works, uh, starting with Rodman and Jeffrey, and then Dwight Schaffner, Spielman, uh, and then finally Mahadev. Um, let's first define what is just without a hybrid quantum fully homomorphic encryption, or in short, QFHG. Um, it's going to be a very minimal definition. It's not the entire Q of H definition. It's going to be enough for what we need. Um, encryption algorithm can be classical, encrypted classical input. Decryption can be quantum. And evaluation algorithm, also a quantum algorithm. A classical computer can encrypt the classical input, take a quantum method, send it to a quantum computer. The quantum computer can take a quantum circuit Q and then evaluate it and get an encryption of the output of Q on Y. Effectively, it computes um, Q on Y under the encryption, not knowing Y. And hybrid QFHG is, is QFHG with one extra property for every quantum state. The encryption of Psi in the hybrid uh, QFHG scheme it's of this structure. It has a quantum part and a classical part. The classical part is the classical encryption of X and Z, which are two classical strings. And the quantum part is a quantum one time phase encryption of a psi. Uh, and as a reminder, if this is a, a general way to write a psi, then the quantum one time phase encryption of psi with respect to X shift and Z shift is uh, you get a Z phase shift and you get an X string shift for the entire superposition. Um, okay, so this is the tool that we use. And you can do a lot of things with hybrid QFG, but one thing is these series of actions. You can take a classical input, you can encrypt it 
And this is the encryption, the hybrid encryption of Y. This is a one time pair of Y along with the classical encryption of the pair. In this, in this case, both sides are classical because the input itself is classical. And secret uh, encryption key used later, uh, used here, for example. And then you take this encryption, you evaluate it on uh, Q, and then you get a quantum one time pair encryption of the output of Q along with these uh, encryption of the uh, pairs, and then you can decrypt the pairs and get access. So we're going to use these three actions. Um, and our starting observation, starting to connect QFAG, hybrid QFAG. And our goal is that when we evaluate QFAG, when we make this homomorphic evaluation, um, this mapping, mapping the, the pad of Y to the pads of this output, uh, sometimes anomalies uh, formally. When this is executed honestly, then um, for some circuits, this mapping is completely random. It outputs a random maximum. Um, so um, for Clifford uh, circuits, for example, uh, this mapping is deterministic. If we know Q, what exactly the circuit Q and R, we know X and Z. If Q contains topoly gates, we don't know like anything um, on X and Z unless we, unless we see them. It's going to be completely uh, one, which raises this question. So it can, it can be the case that uh, our hybrid QFH schemes are just not sophisticated enough, and we can construct a scheme where the evaluation, even for, to even for toffoli gates, is going to be deterministic. Or there is some special quantum circuit, Q star, where the pair transition, the mapping from R to XZ, is going to be uncontrollably random. And uh, why do we care about this? Let's say we have such special quantum circuit, Q star, and uh, earlier we wanted this template, and now we have the QFHE and, uh, and uh, scheme here. And we can think of the QFHE as implementation of our template. The generation key is going to be an encryption, and Q is going to be Q star is going to be hardwired here in this G. And um, if the pad has this forced entropy, you cannot control it, and we think of this encryption of the pad is beta, then also beta has this property of force and so this is what we're learning for now. And um, now we arrive to like the main the main observation of work. If, if you take one thing from this talk, take this slide in the sector and the next one. So we define a subspace generating circuit um, denoted uh, QSG. It takes as input a basis of a subspace, some subspace S of, of n bit strings, and given the basis of, for S, it outputs the subspace state of S. Subspace state is just a uniform superposition over the subspace. Okay, it takes a basis, outputs the state of this of this of the subspace of the space. Um, okay. So here it is. Um, what, what we observe is that there is a very strong combination between the structure of hybrid QFG and subspace generating circuits in two ways. They combine very well in the, well in the following two ways. One is in terms of unclonability, when we evaluate an SGC, subspace generating circuit, the generated encrypted state is going to be unclonable. Two, um, we know from previous work that if I generate on my own computer a, a subspace state, and this subspace has like a, a, the right dimensions, uh, it can be publicly verifiable. This is from the from previous work. We're going to touch on it. But uh, this um, structure of hybrid QFH allows us to publicly verify a subspace state, even if it's encrypted. So we can have it encrypted, not see the state by itself, but still publicly verified. So let's start with the first one. 
that uh, it's generated. That's actually proved this uh, um, this observation. We're going to say that this this evaluation process generates unclonable state, probably unclonable state. Uh, this in particular, as we saw, it's going to say in particular that there is actually forced entropy in the in the pairs of such a, of the evaluation of such a cells. So um, we want to sample a random subspace S, encrypt the basis of this subspace, and then say that if you evaluate a subspace generating circuit, this is going to be unknown. You cannot have two copies of this. So let's prove. Um, yeah, and this is the left. Given like a, a random, say, of dimension n over 2, you get an encryption. This adversary, quantum polynomial adversary, gets an encryption and outputs two copies. This cannot be, you cannot do this with more than a negligible probability. Um, so we sample a basis. We sample a, a, a subspace and, and computer basis. Um, the dimension of S is n over 2. Now we give our adversary, we assume those contradiction, we have such adversary. We give us this encryption, uh, encrypted basis, and A gives us a cloned state, two copies. Um, now we're going to prove this by reduction, so we're reducing to what? We're going to reduce to the security of the QFH. So observe this that S is very small. Very small subspace, it takes a negligible negligible fraction out of the space of all any strings so getting because it's encrypted getting a non-zero vector in s it should be computationally out so this is what we're going to try to do we're going to try to find a non-zero vector in s given this output of the adversary this is going to be a reduction so here it goes we take the first uh, uh, copy and just measure it we get uh, V in S plus X, and we don't know X. But we know that this is the structure. We don't know any of them. And um, now we add V plus X in superposition to the other code. Let's see what happens. So this is just the circuit that adds V plus X to this in superposition. And um, this is the state, and this is after adding. So what happens when we added this? This is what we added. This is what was there before. So the axis cancel on one on one hand, and we still have this shift v, but v is in the subspace. So x got cancelled, but v got like uh, swallowed inside the superposition, and these states are just the same. And uh, now we have this like uh, uh, naked uh, state uh, uh, superposition of S. And when we measure, just simply measure the state, we get a vector, a non zero vector in S with high probability. Um, and as we said, this virus the security of the QFG. Okay. So now we we'll show the first thing. Uh, the second thing is verification. Uh, again, we want uh, the state generated by the honest receiver to be a uh, verifier. So, um, how do we use QFHE uh, more uh, like uh, let's, let's structure our heads how it looks? Um, the sender uh, uh, samples a random subspace, uh, encrypts it, and keeps on the side this classical uh, QFHE uh, decryption key. It's going to send the encryption of the random uh, of the basis of the random subspace. Then uh, the quantum honest receiver is going to compute homomorphically compute the uh, subspace generating circuits and get a, a quantum one time pen encryption of the subspace state. It's going to set up, but okay. How, how do we verify the state? So we're going to heavily rely on the uh, on the, the, the specific structure of, of hybrid usage. And we know from previous work that uh, a subspace state can be publicly verified even only having a classical Oracle access to S and the dual of S. Okay, two classical Oracle, quantum Oracle access to two 
classical function. And we want to verify this encryption uh, encrypted for, uh, and it follows like immediately from the techniques of uh, Amazon and Cristiano, and uh, that uh, this uh, shifted state, this encrypted state, can be verified also having classical uh, or quantum water access to classical functions only for the shifted uh, uh, subspaces. And uh, the second uh, thing that we use in hybrid Q of H, so the, thing, the, the first thing is the fact that, that it is quantum one time pair. And it only moves the entire subspace from one place to another, but it doesn't disturb the subspace structure in, 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 in itself. And uh, the sender doesn't know X and Z in the beginning, but it can get them by decryption easily. By the second message of the protocol can be the classical part. This is where we use the, the two parts of the hybrid proof of chain. Can send the classical uh, uh, encryption of the pads. Uh, the sender can get X and Z, compute what is S, the, the subspace S plus six, and S dual uh, plus Z, and send this classical uh, ideal obfuscation for now. And uh, Okay, the, this, this actually captures like the observation that uh, the states are both clonable and publicly verifiable. And uh, we don't have the time to go over the, the actual uh, security, the actual security proof, but we're going to say a few words on the, like, uh, the second challenge in the construction. Um, so this is what we actually want to, to prove security. And uh, what we saw earlier in the reduction, when we showed the unclonability property of uh, uh, this quantum uh, homomorphic evaluation, uh, is that only when the sender sends this first message, the receiver cannot just right away send two copies of uh, this uh, encrypted uh, subspace. This happens only with an equitable property. This is what we saw. But what we actually want to prove is that, uh, and this, the, the meaning is that the protocol is secure only given the first message, but we want to be able to prove the protocol is secure given, <laughs> given the, the entire protocol, given the, the all three messages, in particular, this message. And we want to prove that this is impossible, which means that after the third message on the sender to this quantum polynomial time malicious receiver, uh, only with a negligible probability, it can send two copies of uh, the quantum uh, event. Um, so, why is it tricky? Um, okay, so the reduction that we talked about, the, like the structure of the reduction, it says that if a malicious uh, receiver manages to clone, then we can break the queue of each. So our, our security game is like, we try to use this algorithm as a black box. This is exactly what we did. And uh, to try to break the queue of each. And crucially, when we play in such security game, we cannot in particular hold the secret key for the queue of each. This is the entire, the entire point. The entire game is not holding this and still discovering something that you shouldn't discover. But what happens here is that if we want to execute the full reduction, we actually use the secret key to generate the third message. And um, in the actual reduction, of course, together with this, what we would like to do is that, the, of course, the first message is just we, we take this encryption and give it to the receiver as it is. But we want to be able to simulate something that is indistinguishable from this without knowing the secret. So the challenge is producing something that is highly indistinguishable from this. And uh, in the paper, which really what uh, finishes our uh, presentation, in the paper, we show a new complexity leveraging technique uh, that shows how, uh, uh, if we assume the standard exponential hardness of uh, uh, learning with errors, uh, we get sub exponentially secure hybrid QFHE, and then using this sub exponential security uh, along with indistinguishability of station, 
Uh, these uh, circuits do not need to be thought of as ideally obfuscated. They, they obfuscated using IO, and we can send something which is indistinguishable, not using the signal. And um, this uh, concludes the presentation. Thank you very much.